of the Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, and the Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. Welcome. We're glad that you're here for Bible study. Um, one of the things we have been missing in our gatherings is the ability to have small groups and study together God's Word. So we invite you to uh, turn with us to the book of Galatians. Having your Bible handy would be a uh, a good thing. And we're going to be looking at, uh, for as many times as we have a study like this, we'll be looking at Galatians, which has a subtitle, Liberty is More Than a Political Idea. And um, we're going to dig right in, and uh, hopefully as we join together and we study the book of Galatians, our hearts will be blessed and our lives will be turned towards serving our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, bless us as we pray together, as we worship together, as we study your word together. Lord, we ask you to open our minds and hearts to the book of Galatians and the author Paul, who uh, was speaking your words to our hearts. He spoke to people 2,000 years ago. Uh, Lord, that word is still um, vital and efficacious for living, it will help us to be the kind of believer that stands strong in a world that doesn't know what to believe. Help us, Lord, as we do study to open our hearts and our minds and um, receive from your hand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Galatians is one of my favorites. Um, The author, of course, is Paul the Apostle. He had a very strong personality, if you uh, take a look at what he said all the way through Scripture. Uh, But that also provided a great, strong leadership that the church needed in its early days. Uh, It was said of Paul that uh, everywhere he went, he either started a riot or a revival, and most times uh, both. Uh, He was a good bit like Jesus in that respect. Um, He wrote to... Uh, not just one church, but he wrote to a series of churches. Actually, he wrote to a geographical or political area known as Galatia, and uh, you see the map that's on the screen. uh, It's really unimportant whether it's a political designation or the condition of the churches uh, that Paul established. Um, Paul established most of the churches that he wrote to, and there were about six or seven of them, on his first missionary journey. You can read about that in uh, chapter four of Galatians. The purpose or the theme of this entire book is the gospel of grace as opposed to the gospel of law. And Paul does a number of things, especially in the opening uh, chapter, where he answers or he defends the charges by a group known as the Judaizers. Um, Well, learn more about them as we go along. Paul's uh, apostleship was being brought into question by a group that uh, had come in to um, the Galatian churches and began to teach things that were not necessarily so. They were questioning whether or not Paul had the right to be called an apostle. And this was the very first attack that these folks had done to undermine the work of Paul in the churches. And if successful, uh, if his ministry or his apostleship could be brought into question, uh, then his ministry, his whole ministry was suspect. So this is a very important letter in the early underpinnings of the church and what the church would believe and what we believe to this very day. Paul's gospel of grace um, was something that is a huge, huge factor in this entire letter of six chapters. The whole point of grace is that if you could work your way into being saved, if you could do enough good stuff, be kind enough, be nice enough, uh, and therefore be okay with God, if God would think you're okay by the things that you have done, then the cross really would be unnecessary. And so we see this uh, really played out, I think, I believe in um, uh, American theology. Most often, if you ask people what it means to be a Christian, 
uh, you'll hear an answer that includes, well, you got to do good stuff. You got to be nice. You got to be kind to people. You don't kick the dogs. Uh, you help old ladies cross the street. Uh, good works equals getting into heaven. But that's not necessarily true. Paul said uh, in many different ways, that's not the way it works. Paul said, it is by grace that you are saved. The setting, Paul had uh, established churches preaching grace, and he wasn't about to see it change to a works theology, uh, getting into heaven by works. The Galatian people had, uh, when they first heard on Paul's first missionary journey, and you see the, the pattern on the map on the screen where he traveled all throughout Asia Minor, uh, the Galatian people received what Paul said very gladly. They received it and acted upon it. Two to three years after Paul left is when the Judaizers, uh, those who didn't agree with Paul and wanted to wreck everything that he did, they come in and start questioning Paul's authenticity as an apostle. So, so let's dig right in. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes, this letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Paul states his equality with Peter and the other apostles by saying that it wasn't any human that made me an apostle. No group, no human authority. This is God who chose me. The source and the agency of Paul's apostleship is God and God alone. Secondhand gospels are not really gospels, and so uh, unless you've gotten it from God, you can't declare it as an apostle would declare. An apostle is a messenger from God, a special messenger, and there's several requirements. Among the chief is that you had to have seen Jesus in the flesh, and uh, Paul did that. Uh, we'll get into that as we get into the letter. The entire case is presented negatively. It indicates a defense. He's defending what he has said previously as being true and what has the Judaizers, those, that group that has come in, uh, they've, they have uh, erred in what they're saying about him. So Paul is setting up a defense argument, if you will. One thing that we do note here is that favorite Pauline emphasis of the resurrection. He refers to God having raised Jesus from the dead. Now, in his apostleship in Acts chapter 1 and verse 21, we see that Paul has seen Jesus. He's had a face-to-face -face meeting with him. So this is Paul's uh, authority as an apostle, as one who, having seen Jesus, gets the message directly from Jesus and is now uh, telling it to the churches. Verse 2, all the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. Notice it's churches, all the different churches in that region. He says the brothers and sisters. We don't know if Timothy was there. He's not called by name, uh, but we assume that he may have been there, and that's who Paul is referring to. And Paul, Paul was in constant fellowship with fellow believers. Um, there's a special quality of sharing the life in Christ that Paul had with these believers. The churches, uh, this was a circular letter. And again, you can see on the map how it moves through the different towns, Derby and Lystra, Iconium and Antioch and Perga and Pisidia. Um, so he's writing a circular letter and he's writing one letter, and it was to be carried to the closest church. And then when they have read it and heard it and dissected it and studied it, like we're doing Bible study here, it would have been circulated to the next church and so on, all the way around in that circular route in the area of Galatia. In verse 3, we read, May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Grace and peace. What a greeting. Grace in the Greek is charis. It's the unmerited favor, the unearnable favor. It is the gift of God that we don't deserve. Grace. And then peace in Greek is the word irene. It's the equivalent, uh, the equivalent of the Hebrew word shalom. To say peace is to say shalom in Hebrew. More than an absence of hostility. Peace 
or shalom is more than just people not killing each other in war. It's much more than that. It's a positive, uh, I don't know who wrote this, but there's an expression I remember, a positive, vibrant expression of fulfillment in right relationship with God. William Barclay wrote about that. Peace is everything that makes life worthwhile. That's what shalom really means. When, I, when a Hebrew says to another Hebrew, a Jew, he says, uh, shalom, what he's saying is, I wish for you everything that makes life worthwhile. So grace, being saved because of the unmerited favor of God, always comes before peace. After all, how could you have any real peace in your soul without being right with God? And you can't be right with God simply by the good works you do. There must be the grace of God. It is the gift of God. It is the sacrifice of God on Calvary's cross that uh, affords us the opportunity to have real peace in our souls. And we move on to verse 4, Galatians 1, 4. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as our Father planned. He gave himself. The humiliation of the giving of Christ is described in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You ought to look that up sometime, just read it, meditate on it, uh, take some time with it. Uh, Jesus was in the form of God. He emptied himself entirely of his prerogatives of divinity, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. And uh, he gave himself. And what's implied when it says he gave himself is that he gave himself entirely. And the question comes down to us, have we given ourselves entirely to him? Are we sold out for Jesus? He gave himself for our sins, the scripture says. That indicates a vicarious or a substitutionary atonement. When we say he took our place, he took my place on the cross, I am saying that I deserve the cross. I deserve the punishment for my sins, but Jesus took my place. He said, Russell, you don't go to that cross. I go to the cross in your place. Romans 5 verses 7 and 8 says, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Literally, the fact that he rescued us is, literally it means to pluck out of danger. The picture is of you and me. We're standing on the edge of a cliff and it's a tall cliff and we're right at the edge and over the cliff is hell and the flames of hell and our footing is not too secure. Jesus comes along and he plucks us out. He snatches us away, almost violently snatching us away from that edge and instead of us going into the flames, he goes into the flames. This was his sacrifice. Dr. Billy Simmons of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary said that Paul started the first spiritual rescue mission. Um, and we are rescued from what? We're rescued not only from the fires of hell, but from this present evil world. The Greek construction indicates from the age, this age of the present evil. So the time is coming in heaven, when glorification, where uh, we are perfectly removed from the presence of evil, will take evil out of the question altogether. C.H. Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher, said, of two evils, choose neither. <laughs> you got to be in this world, but don't be of this world, is what Scripture is saying. And then we move on to verse 5 in Galatians chapter 1, verse 5. All glory, Paul writes, to God forever and ever. Amen. The word glory there is doxa. You hear the word doxology. That glory is present eternally. So let's review what we've studied so far in the first five verses. First of all, Paul was certain of God's calling. He could stand firm as an apostle. 
Secondly, Paul was certain of God's love. He could suffer if that's what it need be. And thirdly, Paul was certain of God's mission. He would not waver from what God called him to do. From that, we kind of turn a little bit and we start to look at what grace really means and uh, what Paul had experienced in hearing that the Galatian churches had started to believe these Judaizers and had started to turn away from what Paul had told them in the first place about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here we see the Galatian churches backslidden, moving towards the cliff, if you will, and in danger, verses 6 through 10. Backslidden and in danger. Galatians 1.6, Paul writes, I am shocked that you're turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. Turning away so soon. The Judaizers were very effective. Uh, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to do what they were doing to persuade mostly unlearned people, um, turn them away from Christ. Uh, the word that he uses when he says turning away, turning away so soon, uh, doing an about face, it's like a military turncoat, as in traitor. I'm surprised you are being a traitor to this cause. I'm surprised you have turned your back on Christ. Now, these were not new believers. Don't forget, it's two, three years after Paul has left them. So they've been walking with Christ for at least two or three years here. They were not new believers. They were just unusually fickle. Uh, an anonymous comment that uh, I have no idea where it came from, but it kind of fits here. They were genuinely saved and greatly stupid. I don't know who wrote that, but uh, you know that's the truth about most babies. Uh, maybe not stupid, but ignorant, not having learned yet. And he says, you're turning from the God who called you. It was God who initiated salvation. It was God who sent Paul from where he was to Galatia to win these people by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. They had believed and had been saved. This was God's initiative. This is the God who had called them. And he said, you, you, you're leaving that, all the grace of God and all his wonderful gifts that he's given to you for another gospel, another gospel, a different gospel. There are three realities here when you use the word gospel. Gospel is perverted whenever anything is added to it. Remember the end of the book of Revelation? Flip to the last chapter. What does John say about the scriptures, about the good news of Jesus Christ? Anybody that adds anything to it or anybody that takes anything away from it, let that person be accursed. Let that person have as much of the plagues of Revelation and Exodus that you could ever imagine. Let it be on their heads. The gospel is perverted if you do anything to it other than preach it exactly as it is. Second, possibility and reality about another gospel is that the gospel does not tell men what to do. The gospel tells men what Christ has done. Think about Peter's Pentecost sermon. He didn't tell the people what to do. Matter of fact, at the end of Peter's sermon, if you remember, he, he said to them, save yourself from this wicked generation. He was warning them. He was telling them what Christ had done for them by going to that cross and then the resurrection, what that meant for them. They asked Peter, what shall we do? <laughs> and then Peter was able to share with them. In Paul's testimony before Herod Agrippa, uh, when he was being tried, uh, Paul didn't tell Herod what to do, but he did tell him what Christ has done for him. And a third reality or possibility where another gospel is concerned, the gospel's calling is great. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. The folly of deserting is far greater. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain. You remember the missionary back in the 60s, I think it was, Jim Elliott. He was a missionary to the Aka Indians. And he wrote this, it is not folly for a man to give up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. He was talking about the gospel in our souls. And then verse seven, 
but it is not the good news at all. Here's Paul's defense. Those Judaizers were telling you about what they think the gospel is, the good news. And uh, Galatians 1, 7, he's saying, but it's not good news at all. He says, you are being fooled. The King James, if you're using that translation, says, these people are troubling you. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Twist the truth. You're being fooled. The Judaizers are not named specifically with this, but to disturb or trouble people is to shake them violently and shake their allegiance to something. You're being fooled. You are being shaken. You're you're listening to the skepticism and the questions they are raising, and you're allowing it to shape your belief in Christ. In many churches, well-meaning believers who really don't understand Scripture actually do this. Uh, intelligence is not in asking unanswerable questions. Uh, there's, there's that old standby, can God make a rock bigger than he can lift? What's, what is the question designed to do? Shake your faith, right? To fool, make a fool uh, of the gospel. Uh, can God make a rock bigger than he can lift? Well, he can make a rock so big that he can't lift it. Well, he can't lift it so he can't do everything. And if you answer no, well, then he can't make that rock. See, it's an unanswerable. God, with his power, can do anything that power can do. And no power can make a rock bigger than it can lift. So these Judaizers were twisting the truth. They were perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel, and we're about to enter into that. Galatians 1, 8, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news, gospel, than the one we preached to you. In King James again, though we preach a different kind of good news, a different kind of gospel. And so we move on to Galatians 1, 9. Paul writes, <clears throat> I say again what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Paul said, uh, I've said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. He was repeating something that he had said on an earlier visit. You know, the way preachers do, they, they tell you what they're gonna tell you, and then they tell you, and they told you what they told you. <laughs> well. Uh, remember, you can't add to the gospel, but you can retell it. And he says, if anybody tells you any other good news, the Greek construction in that sentence suggests that Paul was alluding to some real situation where somebody was actually doing this. They were changing the facts of the good news. Well, they can't really change the facts of the good news, but you can lie about it. Uh, Paul had told them what the gospel was. Jesus died for them. Jesus rose for them, and Jesus is coming back for them. That's the essence of the gospel. Um, but these people had come in and said, no, what Paul told you is not right. Here's the real stuff. So Paul was alluding to some real situation. And some areas of theology, obviously, um, in religion or gospel or church doctrines, are open to interpretation. The gospel of salvation is not. We must stand fast in this. And so we move on to uh, Galatians 1.10. Paul writes, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Pleasing people. Paul had a firm stand for pure gospel, and it got him in trouble with selfish people. And, you know, he was in good company. Jesus irritated the Pharisees. He irritated the temple rulers. He even irritated his own disciples at times. Well, Paul called himself Christ's servant. He wouldn't be Christ's servant if he was just trying to please people. He needed to please Christ. And when he called himself Christ's servant, the word is doulos in Greek, which most often is translated as bond slave. Galatians 6, 17, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The servant of Christ will be just that, no matter who else approves. So let's review what we've learned here. 
Paul says, don't be shaken or taken by another gospel. Test the spirits. First, be certain you know what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Let me just read that for you, because this is the essence of the gospel. This is, again, Paul writing, and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now, here comes the definition of the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Make sure you know what that gospel is. Because